Today on the bench we have a Tran D201. This is a second version in for restoration. So there were three, if you're familiar with Tram D201s, you already know this, but there were three main differences um, or three versions. There were a few other what I'd call like sub subversions, minor minor differences, but three main versions of this radio. There was the original hand-wired 23 channel. There was this radio, which is a has circuit boards inside, and then there was one that was basically the, exactly the same as this, but was a 40 channel. And basically, the main difference there was they removed this channel selector uh, crystal synthesizer board here and installed one that ran from front to back and had a boatload more crystals on it, and it, it gave that one 40 channels. But other than that, the these two versions are the same, or you know, those two versions are otherwise pretty much the same. Same circuit board, like I say, a few minor changes here and there along the time, but um, so, like I say, this one's in for restoration. Uh, I would say it's been stored probably in a damp environment. I see rust around all of the nuts. Um, some of these controls, I wasn't even sure if I was going to be able to get this crystal manual loose. Man, it was. Yeah, well, I mean, without some work, some lubricant, but yeah, just slightly jiggling it a little bit. I was able to get it freed up. All of these controls are, I mean, almost ripped the knob out of your hand. That one won't even turn any farther than that. Yeah, they're they're seized up. Um, usually that's not too hard to actually fix. Just remove the knob, apply a little bit of penetrating oil, and I'm not talking with a spray can with a needle dropper, you know, dropper bottle would apply a drop or two of penetrating oil to the shaft because that's the problem where the the shaft goes into the body so you know the, the control has a nut that holds it in well that part okay threads on the outside it's hollow in the middle and the shaft goes through that you get any oxidation in there between the shaft and that bushing and it just and it seizes up so yeah just apply a drop or two of penetrating oil there work it back and forth once you get it free and actually deoxid works good for that so you know if you have some deoxid tuner cleaner um, but once you get them freed up, then just apply a drop of lubricant. Um, and if you have deoxid shield, that works, you know, the, the 100% S100 works great for that. Just apply a tiny little bit of lubricant there to prevent that from ever happening again. But yeah, just from the outside, you know, even if you didn't remove the cover or pop the top cover, you could see, yeah, it's, it's been in a damp environment. Like I say, the, the stiff control is a dead giveaway there and the rust. Otherwise, it looks good. So I think it should clean up fine. Everything out here should be fine. Uh, inside, yes, it's a dirty, nasty mess. But honestly, we could care less about that. Dirt, you know, I kind of jokingly say it, you know, the protective dirt. But in actually, a lot of cases, the dirt does tend to protect actually the, the finish and whatnot a lot of times. Um, vacuum cleaner will fix a lot of this. I mean, even just really quick, i just grab my dust brush, <laughs> vacuum cleaner, and... So, you know, there you go. You can see how much dust was removed. The circuit board cleaned up fine. So don't be afraid of dirt. <laughs> like I say, a lot of times, dirt is your friend. Once you build up enough dirt on something, it, it's a protective layer. So, yeah, otherwise it looks good. It does have a, which I'm not sure what the heck they were doing here. I actually need to trace the wires out. I just noticed there's one going down the underside. Lord only knows. But it says, on the back, there's two little stickers. It says, Crystal and VFO. I, yeah, hmm. <laughs> because this does have a crystal manual selector. So you can pick where the crystals select your receive frequency and your transmit frequency. Or if you put it into manual, then you have crystal transmit control and VFO. Oh, that's free. I hadn't turned that one yet. Huh, that's free too. Um, but VFO uh, receive tuning. Now a lot of people would, and I'm wondering if that's maybe what that switch is. They might have this wired up because you can unlock this manual VFO where when you switch this knob over to manual, your transmit and receive will then both be controlled through this VFO. I'm wondering if maybe they made that selectable so they could make it so it's factory original, transmit on this, on, you know, 
transmit crystal controlled, receive um, receive controlled, and then if you flip the switch, it would be receive and transmit controlled by the VFO. They might have made it selectable. I don't know why you would do that. I mean, whatever. <laughs> it's in there. If it's if it works fine, we'll leave it or I'll ask the customer. But it's been in there for a long, long time. So it's not, I mean, you can tell by the dirt in this thing. It hasn't been used in a long time. But the, yeah, the wire is cloth covered. So, yeah, that's not even PVC, rubber, or any type of plastic coating. That's actually old cloth wrapped wire so yeah that's that that modification was probably done back when this thing was brand new but the otherwise um yeah it's dirty but honestly it looks pretty good because like the large resistors your biggest problem in a tram um especially any of the ones with circuit boards in them your number one enemy in these radios is heat generated by these big resistors now some of them get hotter than others some of them get hot as firecrackers there's four down here along the front. Those get really hot, and you'll often see circuit board damage there. Um, same thing over here. We have the power supply. Ah, come back, camera. Started to swing down out of the way. This power supply board here. Oh, man, that looks good. Oh, not a brown or black spot to be seen. Oh, this radio's virgin. <laughs> this is such a pleasure. <laughs> Usually these things are baked by the time I get my hands on them. But, uh, yeah, it actually looks really good. You can see, the don't get me wrong, the glyptol, you can see it's cooked out of the resistors, and that's common. These resistors, they should have, they have been a little bit higher wattage, yes, but back then, the only step up from 2 watt and, or a higher wattage was to, at the time, switch over to in a really expensive film-type capacitor instead of a, a composition-type or not capacitor, resistor, was to switch over to a film-type resistor, actually like they used back here. Okay, over on the right-hand side, there's two really big uh, film resistors uh, right in front of the relay here. But they only used them right there because, like I say, they were really expensive at the time. Nowadays, actually, the, the film-type resistors are actually a lot of times cheaper than uh, buying 2-watt-sized original, you know, carbon composition style resistors to replace it. Um, so yeah, that's really nice to see. That's a good sign. Uh, these resistors down here, they're not, they're, I don't think they're even bubbled at all. Eh, they got a little bit of bubbling in the glyptol. But yeah, it's, that's, that's a, that's a great, actually, I just leave that out. That's a great sign. So hopefully, now it doesn't have any two, well, actually it does have two tubes. Uh, when this was sent in, I, most of the tubes were pulled out and they were wrapped up, you know, put in a bag here, so... Looks like they're most of them are original though. I'll have to test all of them, but so both six L sixes are original trams. Actually, it looks like shoot maybe every tube in here is original tram. And actually, judging by the amount of bubbling on those resistors, this radio wasn't used in an extremely long time. It doesn't have a huge amount of time on it because trust me, it would be cooked a lot more. Yeah, I think every single tube in this radio is probably factory original. Another good sign. That's that's a sign of low usage hours, you know. Like I say, dirt, don't pay attention to dirt. That's just atmospheric, happens over time. Your main thing is damage, damage to radios. And so far what I'm seeing is looking good. And let me swing the camera back here a little bit and we'll get it rotated over. The important side on one of these things is the bottom side because what you want to look for is the actual damage to the circuit boards from those areas where i said it gets really hot and this radio looks really really good um, i can see a little bit of browning no not browning radio browning color <laughs> we're working on a tram dang it get brownings out of your head you see a little bit of brown right here so yes it's got but like i say there's four resistors across here high wattage resistors that cook the circuit board right here a lot of times you'll see the traces just baked off of the board and people have bodge wire all kinds of repairs yeah, that looks great i mean that's wow really nice uh, same thing back here where the other two large resistors are you'll occasionally see severely scorched circuit board that looks good and probably one of the most common places is on this board is the the ba board right here um, resistors right here, and where the, the this small power supply board plugs in on the bottom, um, you'll get bad connections, and you'll get 
they had, because there's actually, I can see these, several of these solder joints, they're just broken out, which is common. I always, I always tell people, even if they look good, do yourself a favor, desolder every one of these pins and re-solder it. Trying to re-solder one of these broken out pins that's been, you know, cracked out and oxidizing for 40 years, yeah, you'll never get a good reliable solder joint, so just desolder it and re-solder it. Um, and actually the same thing over here, there's another circuit board, stands up on this side of the radio, just fold these wiring harness gently back so you can get into the pins, desolder all those pins down in here, and resolder all those. That's another common problem point, or all these pins, the, the solder joints will just break out. But yeah, this looks good. I mean, honestly, the only modification I see, and actually, what did they do here? Hmm. I was trying to see there's actually that other wire. Why would they have... Oh, hell. oh, they just ran that to ground. Okay, that's a ground. Okay, yeah, that's all they're doing then. That's switch on there. So, yeah, they're actually making the modification selectable. Yeah, that's kind of a first. I've never seen anybody do that before. <laughs> Make that channel, the VFO unlock, selectable. I don't know if you can see in the camera what I was working at here. Here's that cloth-covered wire. They have it coming to this terminal strip, and that terminal actually just goes down and is riveted to the chassis, so that's just ground. So, yeah, that's what they did. They just made the... VFO modification selectable, so you can use it as it, the radio was intended from the factory, or lock in the transmit to the VFO. But, yeah, looks good under here, all the resistors. So, yep, that's really all, won't know until, you know, get it recapped and put resistors in it. But, uh, I think it shouldn't really need much else. Uh, the controls I'll have to see, make sure they, you know, they actually work. I know, like I say, they're seized up, but they're free enough. As long as I can get a control that just wiggle even the tiniest bit, yeah, you can get them loosened up, just a little bit of penetrating oil. But, uh, yeah, just mainly replace the electrolytic capacitors in this, all the high wattage resistors, and uh, yeah, it looks like this one should be a... no circuit board repairs, no other high power modifications to remove, yeah, no, no modifications on these two resistors here, so nobody's ever tried to get insane amounts of power out of this thing. Which is one of the worst things you can do for one of these. I know people say, oh, that's a bunch of, bunch of horse hockey. Well, yeah, and that's, that's why you're always burning up stuff. <laughs> because. But, uh, so there you go. There's just a preview of what, uh, before I get started on it, you know. Because a lot of times when I do videos on radios like this, you never see what they look like, you know, when I get them. So, yes, I mean, just nasty, grimy, I mean, even, good lord, I'd have to wipe that several times to get down to, <laughs> to clean metal. The dirt is so thick on this thing. But, uh, yeah, so, that's what a nasty radio looks like when I first get them before I do any cleaning. And you'll see later on in the video what this looks like, uh put back to a like new operating condition like I mainly I'm I'll check all the tubes if they're fine we'll just pop them back in but uh, change change out all these one and two watt resistors change out all the electrolytic capacitors to include both of the the can caps over here and uh, good cleanup I think this one should be good to go so I shall return uh, with a much cleaner radio next time Okay, so she's starting to look a lot better. Um, like I said, you'd be surprised what you can do with a vacuum cleaner and an assortment of dust brushes. Um, you start off with the fluffy ones, and then when you get down into some of the you know, nooks and crannies, uh, the the dirt. Because you have to remember, the one nice thing about just atmospheric dust, when it falls, as long as there wasn't something sticky inside the radio to start with, it's it's not really bonded that well to anything that it fell on. So it's just a matter of basically a little bit of agitation with a brush. And some of the stuff, you know, you might need ones, ones with, you know, you can hear how stiff the bristles are on that. But, you know, they were longer, the artist brush, you know. But, and trim the bristles down, that way they get nice and stiff. But it allows you to get down in there around all the little nooks and crannies and really clean up the board. Um, just a microfiber towel dampened with a little bit of isopropyl alcohol you know, go over the inside of the chassis and the transformer you know, don't saturate the radio I always try and say that and I just can't over say it don't go soaking your radio with anything you go getting water inside the transformers any of these coils 
yeah, you may uh, let the magic smoke out. And magic smoke can get expensive really fast. So, yes, just general cleaning, just dusting does amazing things. There was no liquid at all used on any of the circuit boards. Like I say, just a very light dampening, just a mist of isopropyl alcohol in this towel, and then just lightly go over all of the, you know, the flat metal surfaces and whatnot inside. It's all, all that was done there. The circuit boards and everything else, just dust brushes and a vacuum cleaner. And you can see how much cleaner this thing is. And I'm not done yet. Still have more cleaning to do. But, yeah, I mean, that right there would be fine. You know, now if you really want to, um, because the metal chassis do get, you know, it's kind of hard to see in the camera, but to get little speckles actually back here where it's not illuminated, you can see there's little spots, and it's kind of a rough texture. You could polish the chassis if you really want to, but trust me, you will have hours and hours and hours, <laughs> if not days and days, in trying to polish a chassis like this with all you know, lots of parts and stuff stuck down to it. You know, um, you could, it's just going to be very time consuming. Uh, probably the best thing you can do is, again, just take your, you know, not this one, it's obviously dirty from cleaning, but, you know, get a clean microfiber towel and just a very light spritz of something like this. This is gun oil. Um, pick any, whatever your favorite brand of gun oil is. But the nice thing about gun oil is it has corrosion, you know, right there, matter of fact, corrosion protecting. But uh, weapons oils are very, they have usually a very high concentration of corrosion inhibitors. Um, so, you know, on a microfiber towel, that's a spray can, so it's an aerosol. I'll literally just go, pshht, just one little shot of onto the towel, and then just lightly wipe down the surface. You don't want your radio dripping with oil. Don't go spraying it in the radio, because you have to remember, oil is a magnet. Uh, but just a very, very light application across everything. That'll help to prevent oxidation and corrosion from happening any farther. And a lot of times, just with a little bit of rubbing with a product like that, it'll actually take off some, some of this stuff. But, uh, yeah, just a very light coating of something like a gun, a gun oil, a corrosion-inhibiting gun oil, will do a lot for protecting the radio. So if there is any oxidation, which almost all of these radios are going to have to start with, uh, you can prevent it from getting any worse over the next, you know, four or five decades. So, now that I've got it this this far, um, I can see, yes, it looks, honestly, in very good condition. Um, I'd say it was, was a low hours radio. Um, so, yeah, I'll get to, uh, I'll probably leave the controls for right now. I'll probably just go ahead and recap it, uh, change the caps out, then I'll, Remove all the knobs off the faceplate because I'll tape. I always tape the entire faceplate up. Just you know, take a couple layers of thick, uh, like meat <laughs> meat wrapping paper, uh, but uh, put that over the faceplates so nothing gets damaged while I'm doing all the work on the insides of them. But uh, yeah, I'll do that first. Then once I get all that done, I'll clean the faceplate up a little bit. Clean, you know, take all the knobs off because I've got to get all these shafts cleaned up because whoo, oh, they are stiff and. Uh, Test the tubes, pop them back in here, and we'll see if this ba this critter uh, pops back to life. Oh, and another thing you've probably noticed, there's some other stuff missing out of here. So you know, remove your power supply board. Pull this board up and out when you're cleaning, because it just... You know, now, this one's still attached with wires, but you can still pull it up out of the way to clean down in there. Same thing with clean, you know, to easily get in here and clean this board. Um, remove the balanced modulator board. Remove the channel selector board. That's very simple to get out the channel selector synthesizer board. Just take the knob off of the front. From the underside of the radio, there are two screws. So this, this is how this sets in the radio, just like this. So there's two screws. These come up from the underside. Take those two screws loose. Now, stop. Don't go taking it out yet. You have to loosen the set screw on this channel indicating wheel. Okay? There is a set screw in there. If you do not loosen this set screw and you try to pull this thing up and out, I guarantee you, you're going to break it. It sits down. At the top's not the problem. The problem is, on the inside here, there's this slot. The channel selector wheel actually sets down inside this slot. And if you try to pull the channel selector straight back, you know, up and out, it gets caught here. It will not pass through there. So you need to get... You don't have to take it completely off. You can get the boards usually 
you know, just leave it on there because that's what you'll have to do is kind of wiggle it. You hold, kind of hold this, loosen the set screw, kind of jiggle this back and back. And once you get about to this point, you'll get this board back far enough where the shaft is out of the hole right here. Okay, once you get the shaft out of the hole, then you can lift it straight up and out. But yeah, just be careful. Like I say, loosen that set screw so this dial is loose or you're going to break, break your channel indicator wheel. So let me get to uh, recapping and resistoring, and I shall return. Okay, so this is moment of truth. Actually, it's a few minutes after moment of truth. So <laughs> I've got uh, all the electrolytic capacitors replaced, uh, replaced all the high wattage resistors, tested all the tubes. It did need three tubes. One of them was shorted, uh, one had high emissions, and one was very weak on one section, a dual section tube. So those were replaced, uh, powered it up, brought it up slowly on the variable isolation transformer. Um, we had filament voltage, all of the tube filaments lit. Uh, I had high voltage, but I had no sound. Uh, now I was kind of suspect of the speaker, um, and I still am. I haven't tried it again yet. <laughs> uh, actually, I need to see if the problem reappears. But I, like I said, I turned it on and no audio whatsoever. Uh, so the first thing I did was, like I say, the first obvious thing is, are your filaments glowing in your tubes? They were fine. Checked high voltage. I had high voltage. Um, and then I checked for low voltage. There we had a problem. Um, so the power supply board that stands up right there has a fuse on it. And it was blown. And I, I don't even know, honestly, if it was just blown these things are kind of fragile. <laughs> They're one-tenth of an amp. I mean, the filament didn't doesn't look like it blows, because usually when these blow, they pretty much vaporize that little microscopic piece of wire in there. It's just broken in half. So, And this is, you know, obviously old fuse. Um, it looks like it's probably original to the radio. You can see the, <laughs> the end is just black on it, um, you know, from the solder oxidizing <laughs> over the decades. But, uh, so I've stuck a new proper one-tenth amp pigtail fuse in and want to give her a try again. So keeping fingers crossed that it actually comes alive. So my procedure for doing this is uh, turn the radio on. My, and what we're powering it up with is a variable isolation transformer. So for starters, that isolates me <laughs> back here when I touch the chassis or you know, something would go wrong um, inside the radio. Remember, old tube radio, um, very high voltage present in here. When you do something like this, you know, a restoration, you're only changing a few parts, electrolytic capacitors and a few you know, the high wattage resistors. There are a lot of other components in here that could fail, other unknown things you didn't, you know, could have missed easily. Um, so it's best to hook up stuff like this to an isolation transformer for starters to protect you from death because <laughs> we don't want anybody to die. Uh, the next thing is that's also a variable uh, AC power supply. So what I do is, is uh, bring it up very slowly. Now, I'm not talking about over tens of minutes. Um, you know, I'll turn it on, bring it up, bring it up more, more, more. And what I'm monitoring is the current draw of the radio. On average, a Tram D201 draws around an amp. It can be a little bit less, a little bit more. That varies radio to radio because component tolerances, the tubes that are in it, um, you know, the draw. Like I said, it, tubes have a very, very large, um, you know, effect on how much current this radio draws. Uh, tubes from different manufacturers, just like, you know, the 6L6s here came in several different versions. Um, especially some people put those gigantic monster tubes in these things. It, total waste waste of money. <laughs> but, uh, you know, these and both of these, the final and the uh, audio tube, are all, they're both original. The, the only tubes I had to replace uh, was a 6GH8A. Uh, let's see, what was the other one? one yes, a 6GH8A, a 6BK7, and a 6BA6. So... Luckily, three of the low-dollar tubes, because the, the three, well, I guess four, you could say, highest-dollar tubes, these are the highest-dollar, the 6L6s. The 12AX7 back here, um, I guess they're not honestly that bad. 
if you buy a new manufacturer because the 12 AX7s are still manufactured they're used in you know guitar audio amplifiers shoot some stereo amplifiers that are still made today still use 12 AX7s guitar effects systems um, and then the 12 BY7 that's another expensive one you know fairly expensive relative to the rest of the tubes in here but like I say these tubes here depending what manufacturer um, they came from can have a fairly drastic effect on the, the current draw so we want to monitor at that so you know somewhere between let's say three quarters of an amp to uh, an amp if it starts getting if it gets to an amp and a quarter uh, shut it off you've probably got a problem now if you just power it up you're easily going to see that thing flip past the because I have it in the two amp scale you would see it flip well past two amps it does have a three amp slow blow fuse in it because it's vacuum tube operated you've got a lot of capacitors in here that need to charge up um, you know at 120 volts when you just flick the power switch there's a huge current draw so why they use a slow amp a, a slow blow fuse the filaments as soon as they start to heat up you'll see that current draw drop down drastically and then as the tubes start to conduct as the plate everything in the tubes start to warm up and the tubes actually start to work and they start to conduct you'll see your current draw then actually start to come back up but when you're bringing it up on the isolation transformer you'll just see it slowly come up 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 as i increase the voltage you'll see the current draw increase 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 but main thing is you don't want to get too far past an amp when you're doing that when you're slowly bringing it up there's no giant surge of current into this radio so you really don't want to get too much past like i say about an amp and a quarter i'd say stop and see there's probably a problem so the radio's turned on I have it actually, let's see, is it, I don't think it flipped over, flip it over to an antenna. I'll turn the volume up halfway, that way we can hear if we actually have some sound this time. Turn the isolation transformer on. Like I say, I have, have it in a 2 amp scale. I don't know if my arm's in the way, it probably is. Ah, trying to get out of the way. Oh, we're about a half amp there and you can see the needle starts to drop back down because that's the filaments as they're heating up you'll see the kind of capacitors charge every time I crank the voltage up some more you'll see the current draw come up and then drop back down a little bit again now when I got to about this point before I was only drawing me eh, maybe a little over a quarter amp um, because all of the tubes weren't conducting they weren't working properly because haha haha I hear sound what are we on 17 does seem rather weak yeah there's sound but it's definitely sensitivity is not that fantastic which is to be expected honestly if you have one of these things that hasn't had anything done to it <laughs> for decades don't expect these things to be received monsters it's actually probably going to be just like this one rather poor um, and just to see really quick if it's can be brought back up really quick I'm not going to actually do the alignment but I just want to really quick run through it and see if we can get some sensitivity back because usually honestly every single transformer will be out a little bit so picking up some already bit there ah. I just want some static noise and run back through it one more time again
flip over to sideband. We have sound on sideband. It's a good thing. Oh, that's a tight one. Now this is not what I would call a quantitative adjustment because I'm not taking any measurements. I'm just doing it by ear. You know, the initial fire up just to see if it actually works and if I can get some of the sensitivity back. So back to AM. Aha! Well, we do have looks like a bad crystal. One, two, three, and four are dead. Okay, so one of the 20-ish 20, 20 megahertz crystals is bad, but all of the 4 megahertz crystals are good. So there's 4 crystals in the 4 megahertz range. There's, what, 4.4, 4 4.41, 4 4.42, and I think it skips 3 and goes to 4.44. Uh, all of those apparently are working, because if you lose one of those crystals, you'll lose every fourth channel. So, you know, you'd be missing channel one, you would have two, three, four, you'd go to five. Again, a channel would be missing. If you lose the crystals in the 20 megahertz range, you'll lose banks of four channels. So, yeah, it looks, looks like we have a bad crystal. Oh, God, I hope these are socketed. Oh, they're not. i got to take the damn channel selector back out. <laughs> some, some of these radios had the crystals in sockets. You can see these go straight down to the board, so they're soldered on. So i got to pull the entire channel selector back out. But that's the only way to test it. You have to put it, you know, really put, put it in the radio to properly test it. So no biggie. Just two screws. Take the knob off. Extract the board back. Actually, take the B the balance modulator board off and then pull the channel selector back up and out and I'll have to change that crystal but yes yeah, look at that it looks good let's try uh yes. I'm just sitting here feeling how this feels because this thing was bound up pretty bad it actually feels it feels tight, but actually I think it's tight as in, like, tight like new. Because, like I say, I think this thing was fairly low hours from the looks of it. A lot of times by the time I get radios like this, this, the, uh... Because this has two tuning speeds. You have the fine tune, okay? So let's say my finger starts there. So, yeah, like, about three quarters of a turn. It's kind of a fine tune. And then once you get to a certain point, it flips into high speed. But, yeah, that actually feels lubricating and cleaning and lubricating and cleaning. That actually freed up pretty good. So, actually, let's give her a try. Aha! Now, let's see if the... Well, that's a good sign. Turn the manual cow on. Now, let's see if we can hear our tone. And there is no tone around 9. Hmm. Well, let's just see if it's out of whack. Oh, there it is. Okay, so what this is doing is uh, to calibrate this dial. Okay, you pull the pull the knob out. Um, ideally, you put it you put it on channel nine. And what you're looking for is that dip. You hear a tone, it'll go away. Your zero, it's called zero beating. You're looking for that null. When you have that null where there's no sound, that means that you have the VFO producing the same frequency as you do the crystal synthesizer over here. And then you you would calibrate your dial. Yeah, it's off by 9, 10, almost 11 channels. So yeah, it's it's like <laughs> well over 100 kilohertz off because it should do that right here on channel 9. You should get, have a tone when you get to 9. It should gnaw out to nothing and then you should hear the tone again. So yeah, that's and that's just two adjustments. There's an inductor right underneath that light bulb. <laughs> get a pointer here. Remember, high voltage in these radios. So you have an inductor right here and a uh, 
trimmer capacitor right here. These are used to set the, the top and the low end of the range to get it. So not only is it centered, but you also have the proper frequencies from one end of the dial to the other. Um, but yeah, so that it works. It just needs to be calibrated, which and that's part of the alignment procedure. So yeah, so good grief. Probably by the time you get to around 20 to 23, somewhere in here, you're probably close to channel 40 around here. But yeah, that's that's good. I see the needles peg far left. Something wrong with the clarifier, it looks like. Hmm. And the light just now popped on. To check into that, delayed reaction. <laughs> I if it just took the neon tube a second to fire up, because those are actually neon. Yeah, I'll have to check that too. Yeah, I'm not hearing any other than right at the end of the range. Actually, on both ends of the range. Yeah, so the clarifier seems to... not be working properly. So, overall, that's good, though. Um, actually, need to check transmit. So, actually, let me... Uh, uh, we have actually the microphone the customer sent with it. Haven't tested it yet. And yes, it's still nice and dirty. <laughs> it needs a good polishing. And that's well, non amplified, so actually, no amplifier board in there, you can see through the hole. I'll just hook this critter up here. And let me flip over to dummy load. Nothing. Relay is clicking, but we have no output. Audio, audio, oh. Okay, so we'll have to diagnose the no transmit problem. Again, no big concern. I know the high and low voltage circuits are both working. We have receive. Um, we have actually, it came in fairly good. We actually have fairly good receive. Actually, let me just flip it back over. Turn a s signal generator on here. Uh, we'll set her at, let's say, one microvolt. And let's see, channel 19. And let's see if we can actually hear one microvolt. Crystal AM. And there it is. So, sensitivity is good. And like I say, we can bring that up a lot better. Actually do the, the real alignment. So I have a <laughs> time delay. Yep, it came, came on. A time delay neon tube. <laughs> it may just need a new bulb. They c it's rare that neon tubes go bad, but they can go bad. You have to remember it's a, it's a sealed envelope. And if the, it's just like a vacuum tube, if the, gl the glass envelope um, is not perfectly sealed, and honestly, there is n no such thing as the perfect vacuum seal. All of these vacuum tubes at some point in the future will all lose their vacuum, um, you know, because it's a metal, metal leads going through a glass envelope. Eventually, they will all leak, but uh, yeah, so th that might be the problem with that. Yeah, because it's not firing, not firing, not firing. Yep, and there it comes on. Um, and I've seen neon tubes do that before. If they lose lose a little bit of their charge, that's what they do. They kind of get slow to, to fire up. So, but yeah, no transmit, slow tube. Clarifier seems to have no effect. So, um, and actually I need to check that, because remember, this has that switch in the back. Uh, I need to actually trace that out. I just left it installed for now. Um, wasn't anything hokey with it. It didn't look, uh, how should I say, you know, 
didn't look too suspect. It looked like a, a fairly straightforward modification somebody did. Like I say, it's just weird though. Crystal or VFO, they, they're they letting this modification for the manual selectable. Just never seen anybody do that before. So, so let me do a little bit of troubleshooting here um, and uh, see if we can get uh, some transmit power. Probably pop in a, a replacement new neon bulb or tube. Um, get the clarifier figured out, but otherwise, no smoke. Sounds good. Oh, and one thing. <laughs> I've had people ask me, Hey, Mike, I was working on my Tram D201, and it won't turn on. Something, let me turn it off here. Something to remember, if you're working on one of these radios, and you have the top cover open or off, your radio's not going to turn on. There's a switch. Don't forget, these have a safety interlock switch. And without the lid on, there's a little tab on the underside of the lid. When you fold the lid down, that little tab comes in and pushes this switch. And if you have a very, very late uh, version 40 channel, um, the last models that they made, because they were, uh, I guess you could say they were starting to cheap out, you know, competition and whatnot. I'm trying to get the camera position here so it stays. Um, they w did away with the hinge tops. They were just screwed on, and there were two screws in the front, one here and one here. Uh, this switch is no not in those radios, or it's, it's in the radio, but it's not located back here. It's actually the screw that holds down the top cover right here is actually what pushes that switch. So yeah, in those radios, you just need to make sure when, you know, if you're working on the radio and you want it turned on with the with you know, the top cover off, you need to make sure you have a screw in there. Um, with these, I just use these little plastic clips here. Or pl flip around there, little guy. Little plastic clamps, because the spacing's just about perfect between that screw head and the lever there. That it holds it back and works per, and it's all plastic. So because you got to remember, there is high voltage there. Um, you know, line voltage there. So I don't have to worry about getting electrocuted because it's it's uh, plastic. But, uh, yeah, I'm going to say so far, so good. It's got some problems, but not to be expected. Or, you know, considering the condition of this thing, um, that really doesn't concern me that much. And it could be that relay is our prob problem with transmit. I had not, uh, I only cleaned the outside of it. Um, it may just be the contacts are extremely oxidized. I kind of doubt it because receive sensitivity, receive is working fine. So, yeah, obviously the contacts aren't too bad because we do have receive. But uh, that's always a, a, a good place to start. Um, you know, just I can just pop in because I have replacement spares here. So I can pop in another relay just really quick and see if that's, if the transmit comes in, then I know it's the relay. If not, I'll go through, and it could be just like the receiver. It was very low sensitivity. I may have output power because I didn't hook up an oscilloscope, didn't have a spectrum analyzer turned on uh, to actually see. I may have had a carrier. It may just be so low that it's not it's not registering on a watt meter. Um, so again, that could just be alignment. It, it, the the final section could be so far out of alignment that yeah, it's just it's not visible on a, on an analog meter. So let me do a little bit of troubleshooting and. Uh, we shall see what I find, and I'll return. I thought I'd really quick show. First thing I actually checked was the, the transmit condition. It is transmitting. <laughs> like I said, uh, I really needed to check that with something that could check at signal levels a lot lower than an analog watt meter. So I turned on the spectrum analyzer. Um, I have the center frequency set to 27.185 so channel 19 and I had the span set to 50 kilohertz so five channels or the channel we want and then two adjacent channels on you know, on each side um, and just in case you're not familiar with the spectrum analyzer what what is the difference between a spectrum analyzer and something like an oscilloscope so an oscilloscope measures amplitude um, over time Okay, so you, you're probably familiar with seeing pictures of, you know, waveforms. Actually, let me fire it up here. Uh, take her a second to boot up, and we'll just tap into the synthesizer circuit here. Just clip onto the oscillator. 
put right there. And then once that gets done firing up, we'll be able to see it. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so we can see the squiggly line. So that's the, the, the actual frequency that's being generated by this. And we can change the time base and then the amplitude, that's your voltage. And it goes positive and negative, positive, negative. And if you see, actually, if I change channels, actually, that's the four dead channels, you'll see that it actually changes. That line will get stretched out and squeezed together. And you can see the amplitude changing, because this is crystal controlled, so each crystal oscillates in higher or lower levels. But the main thing is, you can see, it, it'll actually... That's the frequency change, because as I change channels, the frequency changes, so that line will get a little bit squeezed together or farther apart. The spectrum analyzer, again, looks at amplitude, but it looks at, at amplitude in the frequency domain. So, when I key the microphone, because I have the spectrum analyzer attached to a sampling port on the output, you know, in the, the, out, the coax cable is connected to the back of the, the radio. I have a sampling port attached to that, and then that runs actually through a, a DC block, uh, just to prevent me from, depending on what I'm working on, I don't go shoving a bunch of DC voltage into the front end of the spectrum analyzer and blowing it up, so I've got a good high quality DC block. Um, but if I key the microphone, and, oh, I changed channels. Let me get back to channel 19. There's our carrier. And actually, you can see as I talk into the microphone, we even have some modulation. And if you actually look down at the radio, while I'm talking, you can see the uh, modulation light is modulating away. And strangely enough, that one stays on. Hmm, that's something else I need to check into now. <laughs> but it does, it does transmit. And actually, you can see if I change channels. So that's what... Let me turn the uh, mic gain down on this thing. But that's what a spectrum analyzer does. It looks at amplitude and tells you where in the frequency spectrum it is. And you can set the bandwidth, the actual part of the frequency spectrum you're viewing. So you can change it. So right now I have it set to, like I say, to encompass five channels. But I could set it to view one gigahertz of, of bandwidth and then can see every, all the energy that's being put into that bandwidth. Well, like I say, a spectrum analyzer is really handy for checking really low signal levels because it's a lot more sensitive than something like that, just an old, an old school analog watt meter. Um, so there, it you know, it does work. I'll actually, let's try sideband. Oh, does it help if I turn the mic gain back up? I'm not going to have any RF power without modulation on sideband. So, sideband appears to work. Actually, let me back to 19, and we'll try upper and lower. Hmm, have a problem. <laughs> Another problem just discovered. So we appear to be missing upper sideband. So, yeah, upper sideband's gone. So... Could have a bad, uh, I don't know if I checked receive, actual receive. I don't know if I had that when I had the signal generator hooked up. It may not be actually, I mean, I hear static, but that's not saying it's actually receiving one channel. So I'll need to check that. Could be, uh, again, like the crystal that's bad for channel 1, 2, 3, and 4. Could be a bad crystal on the balance modulator board. Because um, there, there are two crystals on there for your upper and lower side band offsets. Um, oh, another thing we can check, the clarifier. So, turn the mic gain back down, put her in AM, so there's our little tiny, because that is very small signal, and you can see as I turn the clarifier, nothing's happening if I get to the extreme, oh, there it bounced over. Nothing, yeah, it just all of a sudden jumps, there's no change anywhere else, and you get to the other end, yeah, and it changes, yeah. I think the clarifier control itself is actually bad. Because that's usually what will happen. If the carbon resistive material on the control actually flakes off, and a lot of times that's that's what I'll see happen. 
uh, when that carbon resistive material flakes off the wiper isn't touching anything it's just rubbing against the basically the circ the, the little circuit board piece there until you get to full rotation when you get to full rotation then it actually touch because remember there's three terminals this one attaches to the wiper and then there's basically a horseshoe comes around that has the carbon resistive material printed on a little board if that resistive material comes off, the only time the wiper makes contact is when it touches the metal contacts on either ends as it swings around. So yeah, it's actually a, a good sign that it's it's just a, a bad control. Nothing, 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 and then yeah, all of a sudden it jumps. So looks like it needs a clarifier control. I've got a modulation light that seems to hang on. Slowly go out. That's almost like a capacitor discharging. Somebody's got something wired. That's the thing, though. I didn't see any modifications other than that. I'll have to check into that. Because that should just go out. That's kind of kind of strange. So, another problem. But, like, a little, little nitpicky things. The output power, it has output power. So, there's no doubt in my mind, it just needs to be... I just need to align the uh, transmit section, much like the receiver. It was really, really low sensitivity. So, like I said, that's the advantage of having a spectrum analyzer. You can see your RF energy. You can actually visually see it and see where it is in the RF spectrum. You're not looking at a watt meter that, yeah, you've got power, but you have no idea where it's actually being transmitted at. With a spectrum analyzer, it allows you to see where in the R, you know, where in the frequency span it's actually at and you can also then you know depending on where you set your band bandwidth limits at you can see harmonic energy so you, know, you could set on like channel 19 you could set the spectrum analyzer for a center frequency of 54.37 megahertz that would be exactly two times channel 19's frequency or the second harmonic so you know when you're adjusting an old tube radios when you're adjusting the TVI filter modern day radios it's just it's called a 54 megahertz trap circuit but that's what you use as an actual spectrum analyzer and you're adjusting for minimum power at the second harmonic but uh yep so good sign transmits actually working just fine uh, in AM and lower sideband upper sideband not so much so that like I say that could be a problem on the uh balance modulator board and could be switch. I mean, there's lots of things it could be. It just need to need to do a little bit of troubleshooting there and see what's going on. But uh, yep, it's looking better and better. Main thing is we got RF power out. Doesn't matter how tiny it is, um, it's actually transmitting. It's just a matter of figuring out why it's low. And like I said, I, I get the feeling just just alignment. So there you go. Just a little bit more. <laughs> Ever have one of those problems that you don't know how you fixed it? <laughs> well. The no transmit, like I say, it was transmitting just a tiny bit of a signal. So I uh, flipped it up on its side, uh, checked, actually before I did that, I checked the output of the balance modulator board, the output to the driver. So I had signal there, put it on channel 19, had a nice ultra strong 27.185 megahertz signal coming out of the balance modulator board flip the radio up all I did was is basically attached to the exact same point on the bottom side of the radio from the you know the, the terminal on the bottom where it connects there's a a resistor there that goes across two terminals but that goes over to pin 2 of the driver tube I connected to that I, what I was going to check was was the input to the driver the output of the driver input of the final output of the final see if I was having because I actually had tried I thought maybe it might be out of a you know alignment horribly no nah, that wasn't it um, then anyhow the inst I had the radio keyed you know microphone in my hand <laughs> keyed the mic turned the uh, or grabbed the scope probe the instant the scope probe touched that wire from the balance modulator board terminal to the driver tube it started working and it's you can hear my that click over there that's my BK 1040 is clicking in because yep it's doing a little bit over four watt carrier now so you know it's I've got the span on that still set to 50 kilohertz but yeah it's working fine so Lord only knows I have looked I pulled the, the balance modulator board back out all the solder connections look perfectly fine. Um, now this radio was extremely dirty. Now I cleaned all the contacts and everything, you know, tube sockets and whatnot. 
I rechecked them. Yeah, they look fine. None of them are oxidized or anything. The solder connections between the balance modulator board, the pin, the header, you know, pins that mounted to the chassis. I don't know. I can't get it to not transmit now. It's maybe I scared it. <laughs> I don't know. But yep, it wasn't working. But the instant dead scoop probe touched. So, uh, and yes, I did uh, verify. I checked. Didn't dawn on me. I hadn't actually checked to see if that worked the way I thought it did. Just looking at it the way they had it wired up, it looked like that was too. Because, uh, like I say, normally this would have the only receiver when you tune this, and then when you unlock them, or actually you're locking it together, uh, which is a common modification for people to do, especially with the 23 channel radios, because you only have uh, the crystals in here will only get you two channel 23, but if you unlock, or I actually call it locking, you're locking the receive and transmit uh, frequencies on the manual control, then that allows you to get your full 40 channels and actually plus, because these dials go, heck, I don't even remember, 505 is it? No, 550, uh, 27.555. But main thing is, it allows you to get 40 channels. Um, but uh, that is that is what that does. It's It allows you to basically install or remove that modification. I'm not sure why you would want it selectable, but it's not hurting anything. So, you know, I'll just neaten up the wiring there and... Uh, yeah, just leave it, because uh, it's not hurting anything. And if we have the customer wants this to be factory stock configuration, leave it in the crystal position. If you want it to work uh, locked so you can adjust your transmit frequency with this, just flip the switch. So just leave it like that. Um, so yeah, like I say, got transmit power now. So you know, there's channel 19, 18, 17, 18, 19... 20. And if you, you're wondering why there's a huge jump between 19 and 20, and there's not between 19, you know, to 18 to 17, that's because there's actually a missing channel between channel 19 and 20. People call it the A channel. Um, there is no 27.195 in CB. Um, so that's what that skip is there. And the uh, manual uh, position, actually that's what it's in right there, manual. So actually it's crystal control. But you can see I had it in manual, and the crystal control still has control over the transmit frequency. And then if I flip this switch, I key the mic now, you don't see a signal. It's because I need to... It's way down here somewhere. Remember this VFO is... There it comes. <laughs> it's way out of alignment. Actually, I need to put this on channel 9, actually. So right there is channel hair up more. Channel 19 is right there, just a little bit below channel 8. So yeah, like I say, that's way way out of whack. But yeah, so you can see you can adjust the transmit frequency with that switch flipped. So it has the receive and transmit frequencies locked. But yeah, uh, just leave this leave the modification in there. Like I say, it's not hurting anything. And that it then gives the customer the option of using it whichever way he wants. So, um, uh, one other thing I did find, I really don't know how in the heck this thing was receiving or transmitting or doing anything. <laughs> this cable, this coax cable here, now they use RCA connectors on them, but there's where it's soldered down to the board there. I hadn't noticed it previously, but it, the wire, the center conductor, you know, the actual output of the, you slide forward here a tiny bit, the center conductor, which is the output of the synthesizer board here, the wire wasn't attached. Now, I'm not sure when I was doing adjustments if I bumped it and maybe broke the last strand of wire. Um, there almost had to have been a strand of wire attached, or I don't see how in the heck it would have received. But, uh, yes, yeah, so I just actually, here it is, right here. <laughs> That's the, the piece I cut off the end of that. But yeah, you can see there's, get it to focus, 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 focus. Yeah, it's, there's not even any solder there. So I guess it just, it was down to, it was on its last leg, or last strand, and finally broke off. But uh, yeah, so I just cut a little bit off the end there, stripped it, and soldered it down so it's w well attached now. But uh, yeah, so transmit power is fine, receives fine. Um, I do need to pull this board out. Actually, it's uh, I had 
Now, I won't know until I actually do the alignment if there's any other crystals that may need to be replaced because they're out of, uh, out of spec. That's one thing uh, with Tram D201s. It's bad in one instance, but in the other, on the other hand, it doesn't really matter. Now, in a radio like this, it really doesn't matter. If your crystal, and what I'm talking about is crystals drift. The frequencies will drift over time. They're a component, and they're mechanical. It's actually a piece of quartz in there vibrating. It's a you know, quartz crystal. Um, it can change over time. It ages. Crystals age, and they, the, the frequency that they actually oscillate at will, will change one direction or the other over time. Now, there's trimmer capacitors. You know, like you can see, there's two crystals right here, and there's a trimmer capacitor behind each one to bring them back into calibration. The problem is, if they drift too far out, you run out of range with the trimmer capacitors, and you can't bring it into, into spec. So you can't do the alignment properly, because you can't get the frequencies where they need to be. Um, now, in a stock configuration radio, that's a problem, because this board controls all of your transmit frequencies. So... If you want to transmit on those frequencies, whichever crystal might be bad, it's affecting you know different channels. But you would need to change that crystal, so it would need to be replaced with one, you know, a new one or a good used one out of another you know scrap radio, let's say. But to bring it so you can get it within intolerance. With a radio like this, however, having that switch or not, like I say, normally it's just hardwired; it's not selectable. But by having that switch there. By being able to lock the transmit for, or make the, the VFO control the transmit frequency as well, you really only need one crystal here. That's the one that's because this should be set to channel 9 when you're using the VFO for your trans, uh, the transmit frequency, or actually for anything, for receive as well. But So as long as you can get the channel 9 frequency output from this correct, then it doesn't matter. All the other crystals could be bad. Matter of fact, you could remove the rest of the crystals. Honestly, they don't even need to be there. As long, but you would only then be able to use the VFO. But that's one advantage of having this VFO with the receive and transmit locked. As long as you can get the channel 9 output frequency correct on this board, then you can just use your VFO all the time. If it's locked, or as they would say, locked from the factory, like I say, I kind of considered that unlocked. Um, I don't know where the terminology over the years ever got mixed up on that. Like I say, I think factory configuration, you would call that unlocked because the transmit frequency is not locked to the receive. Um, but uh, in any case, yeah, so this does have, we know channel the crystal for channel 1 to channel 4, the controls from 1 to 4, the one mixing crystal is bad. I also suspect that, what was it, 21, 2, yeah, 20, 21, 2, and 3, actually, we can, it's, it's weak. It works, but in sideband, it's causing a problem. Actually, let me see if it's still actually doing it. So I'll put it in channel 19, and let's see, turn the mic gain up. Audio, 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 audio. Yeah, actually, it died right there. Audio, 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 audio. Audio, 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 audio. Okay, no, it was 21, 2, and 3 are fine. It's 20, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Yeah, so 17, 18, 19, and 20 don't transmit an upper sideband. Audio, 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 audio. Yeah, so they're fine in lower sideband. Lower sideband. Now, that may be the output may not be tuned because I have not done the alignment yet so you know once once I get the uh, the coupling transformer for that aligned that may actually come back but uh, yeah so I think the majority of the problem I still got the clarifier I need to pull that out I'm pretty sure just the carbon resistive material on that it's just gone because <laughs> like I say I showed you how the uh, you know when you turn turn the clarifier nothing happens nothing happens on transmit because it's it is unlocked you know nothing happens nothing happens and all of a sudden the frequency changes and you go around the other way nothing 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 and all of a sudden it changes so yeah I think just all the carbon material flaked off of that um, the modulation light could have been some of this transmit problem it's working fine now so you know it goes out 
may have had something to do with the uh, transmit problem. That's that's possibility. Uh, so, yep, yeah, I think the only thing left is the light. It works. I mean, honestly, do I need to change it? Probably, the damn thing will probably last another hundred years. <laughs> Quite honestly, it's a tiny bit slow to start. Um, I could ask the customer if he wants it changed. But yeah, once it gets a little bit warm, you know, once it's on and warms up just a tiny bit, it fires right up. But if you leave it off for, you know, any any length of time, as the glass envelope, you know, is, it basically it cools down, then it takes it a split second to, to fire back up. But, uh, yeah, so, pull the clarifier control out. Um, I think it'd be ready for an alignment. And, uh... Well, see how many other crystals it may or may not need. And like I say, what I need to do is I'll find out what crystals it will need. I know it needs at least one, probably probably two. If, if any, check the uh, you know the, if the other ones are within tolerance or not. And if it does need other ones, what I'll do is I'll ask the customer. That's one of those things I just let the customer because you can spend a boatload of money replacing a lot of, a lot of rock on this thing. <laughs> and forty channel radios, same thing except even worse. They have the the synthesizer board runs the whole way, almost to the whole way to the back, from front to the back of the radio, and it has almost twice as many crystals as are on this board. And you can have a radio that can have 10, 12, 15 crystals that are bad. You can have a brand, I've seen that, radios that look like they're brand new, hardly ever used, and it'll have 12 or 15 crystals bad. And then you'll get one that looks something like this one was. Just nasty, half pound of dirt inside. I mean, you can't even see components. They're so nasty. And it may need one crystal or none. So, yeah, condition of the radio a lot of times isn't a good indication of the condition of the crystals. But, uh, yeah, like I say, what I do is, is find out what it needs. And then I'll ask the customer, do you even want them replaced? Because if you plan on using the VFO, you really don't need them. You know, you can save yourself some money there. So if you own one of these, that's something to think about. You can have a boatload of bad crystals as long as you can get the the the, the output frequency right on channel nine. Just use just use the VFO if you have this locked. The receive and transmit frequencies locked. That's you know you can save yourself quite a bit of money there because crystals do get expensive. And like I said, this one's even worse because that the crystals are not socketed so you have to pull this entire board out to change the crystals so and that's just if you're paying somebody to do that that's just more expense um, so i shall return i guess after the alignment um, and alignments sometimes um, you'll get to a stage like this where you're pretty confident everything seems to be working fine i mean other than crystals and whatnot like i say i actually need to do the alignment to see if there are any other ones bad but you'll get to a point like this where you think everything's fine and you'll get halfway through the alignment and you'll find other problems you can't get the meter zeroed or you can't get it to read properly you know you'll put 100 microvolts emf or 50 microvolts into 50 ohms into the radio and you can't get the meter calibrated for s9 or receiver sensitivity you thought it was all right but then when you actually go in and you're actually taking quantitative measurements you know you actually do the alignment and you're using test equipment you're not just doing it by ear and yeah you just can't get the receiver sensitivity right or you find weird audio hum problems in transmit when you start checking the you know, actual transmit audio just hear, hear what it sounds like a lot of times you'll find problems in in the middle of a, a transceiver alignment um, and like I've said in other videos, the alignment procedure is a good place to start a lot of times with troubleshooting. So if you're having synthesizer problems um, or balanced modulator board problems, you know, go to that section of the alignment procedure because it'll tell you at, on this channel in crystal position, you should have this frequency on the output or on this jack or what the frequency should be coming out for your 4 megahertz oscillators. So you know, the alignment procedure actually is very a very handy tool for using in diagnostics. But uh, like I say, I'm to that point now. I think I can try to do the alignment, see what other crystals may be needed, um, see if there are any other problems, and if there are, fix them. But uh, it's looking good. All the switches now. I do need to still change these nuts and the washers because those things are horrible, rusty. Faceplate cleaned up pretty good. The knobs were just. We're good already, but uh, yeah, the faceplate cleaned up pretty nice. But yeah, I gotta get rid of those <laughs> those rusty nuts. Make it, whew, they look they look pretty horrible in there, especially now that it's cleaned up. But uh, and so I shall return again. 
So yes, it does need a clarifier. <laughs> it says, let's see if I can get this, yeah, we go. actually get it dismantled the entire way. It's still wired in circuit, but I took the uh, can, actually right here, the back off of it, to inspect the uh, resisted material, or <laughs> what's left of it in there. Yeah, you know, wiper, everything else is okay, but yeah, the... Oh, let's see, a little flashlight here. And you can see, <laughs> that's why it only worked at the very ends of its range. All the carbon material is coming off, so it's only making contact here and here. But yeah, it's no longer a continuous <laughs> track around there. So, I'll pull out a nice, good, vintage... Um, IRC control from back in the 1940s and 50s, and I'll build one. I've shown shown those before. Back in the day when you uh, made your own control, you picked the, the value you needed, and you have a, a set. You pick which shaft you need for it, the mounting type. Um, really nice universal cab. God, I just wish they made those things. Still made those things. Uh, the man, and a lot of people say, man, why would you use something as old as that? It's still new. There's nothing wrong with it. And honestly, they're just better quality than uh, the majority of the controls you get nowadays. Um, you know, the stuff made in the 40s, 50s, 60s, even controls like this in the 70s and whatnot. Yeah, just just better overall quality. That's just a <laughs> victim of time right there. Looks like there's a bunch of flakes of the <laughs> control falling out there. Yeah, here's a here's a piece of it. <laughs> So, yeah, I just prefer the old ones to the new ones. Um, like I say, they just tend to tend to be better build quality than the the mod, a lot of the modern junk you get. Um, and a lot of times, now this is not one of those cases, but in a lot of cases, uh, you can't find, there there are no modern controls to replace them with because they actually there's very few of these made anymore um, in this size with you know the large format with the large shaft. Uh, you know, most of your controls nowadays, they're miniature, you know, little tiny things. Uh, controls like this, they only come in a few values nowadays. Um, so, sometimes you'll run across stuff like this. If it's one of those oddball values, you may not be able to find a modern replacement. Um, they may make something in the format and the size, but uh, you may not be able to find the value that you need. And it's like occasionally you'll run into uh, tapped potentiometers. And what I mean by tapped is they'll actually have, you can see how these are attached here and here, somewhere in this, it can be anywhere along here because it depends where the tap is. But they'll actually have another contact. There'll be a fourth terminal sticks off, and it'll have a little tap that sticks off to the side. That's what they call a tapped terminal. Um, yeah, you just, there are, there are no replacements for those. So, like I said, you have to use, <laughs> in a lot of instances, um, old stuff like that, where the old the old build your own controls, and most all of the companies had them back in the days. Uh, Mallory, uh, Centralab, IRC. I mean, you pretty much name the any company that made controls back in the day. That's what they had uh, for service shops. Instead of having to stock, like with the IRC uh, kit, I think they probably had the the largest variety of parts to build controls. I think it's something you can build something like a million different controls, you know, with what basically the parts you can stick on one three three shelf shelving unit, um, you know, with just that amount of parts, you can build potentially over a million different controls with all the because you have to remember for every control, there's a couple hundred different shafts you could use with that, <laughs> you know, but. Uh, yeah, I just, man, I just wish they still had them. So, yep, in any case, let me get this little critter, now that I it, have 100% verified the control is, uh, yeah, it's definitely, definitely seen better days. I'll get a, get a new one made up and stuck in there, and, because uh, I did forget about that. I, I have to do that before I do the alignment, because um, centered clarifier is kind of part of the alignment procedure. <laughs> if you can't center the clarifier, you can't do the alignment. So, I'll get that stuck in there, then I'll do the alignment. So, shall return again. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, nothing like trying to listen to two dozen people at the same time. <laughs> so, as you can see, she's all back together now. Um, I don't think I'd shown the top cover. Actually, I think the... I have to go back and check the videos, but I think the sides and the top cover were off when I started the videos. I always remove everything so nothing gets damaged while I'm working on it. But, uh, yeah, the top cover kind of looked basically like the inside. Nasty. <laughs> and, uh, whatever was... I don't know if you saw a big goopy glop of stuff on top of the transformer when I first started. There was a matching goopy gloppy blob of stuff right here too. Um, this reminded me of glue of some kind that just never dried. Um, kind of like Gorilla Snot. You know, when it's still wet. If you're an auto mechanic, you know what Gorilla Snot is. Um, weather stripping adhesive. <laughs> it was about that consistency. Really sticky, gooey stuff. But got all that cleaned off. It's been about a, almost a half hour scrubbing that cover to get all the the uh, goo and dirt off of it. And then, uh, uh, if you own one of these, something that you can do to help pro, help protect these. Um, I don't don't recommend using uh, like regular automotive waxes uh, on flat surfaces. They're fine. The problem is when you try to wax something like this cover, its problem is it's louvered. You're going to get that stuff in around, you'll just never get it all out. You'll have little white spots at all these little cracks and crevices and whatnot. So do a really good cleanup job, and then you can use something like this. Spray-on wax, made by Griots. Uh, make really good, really good products. But uh, this is a, you know, waterless cleaner, but it's also a, it's a or spray, this is a spray-on wash, and then I also have a bottle of, um, so this is good for, you know, cleaning it. It gets off a lot of the gunk that a lot of, uh, Normal cleaning products won't. The main reason I like a lot of the automotive products is um, cleaners like this, and they also have spray-on wax, which I actually put a coat, coat of their spray-on wax on, is they're designed for paint finishes. You know, it's not like uh, a lot of your cleaners. You actually have to be careful. Some cleaners like, uh, sim sim I think it's Simple Green's not too bad, but if you use some of the, like, Purple Power products and some of the other ones, some of those are actually rather caustic. They have some really nasty surfactants in them. Um, you know, you can get products that are very benign, I guess you could say. Um, like, I use Texas Refinery Cleaners, and if I use, like, their Big Red um, or their TRC Cleaner the or TBC Cleaner, those have a very, very low pH um, they're not an alkali, but they're also not uh, corrosive. Um, they have a very neutral pH. Actually, the big red cleaner is actually NS NSF1 certified for, you know, cleaning using in food preparation areas. But, you know, if you get a product that's made for automotive paints, that's pretty much a guarantee. If it's if it's safe to put on car finish, it's safe to use on the paint on your you know on your radio. So yeah, it, just to be safe. Like I say, you never know some of those cleaners. They might etch the aluminum. That's one of the big problems. Uh, they might not damage the paint, but anything that's aluminum, if you get it on there, it will stain it. And I have seen that happen on tractor trailers. Somebody out there spraying their tires down with a, a cleaner like Purple Power or something, and some of it oozes down on those expensive Alco aluminum wheels. And... You know, they come back with a hose, and they hose it off, and there's this white streak that runs down the rim. That's because it actually etched the aluminum. So, a little bit of safety. Use products made for car finishes. You're guaranteed it's not going to, I mean, as long as they're a decent product. You know, you're pretty much guaranteed they're not going to damage the paint surface on your uh, radio. Um, another thing, the end covers, they were a little bit faded. I've told, told you before... Best way to restore a, a wood cover like this. Now you can use something like uh, you know, old English. A lot of people like that, and that's great for really chipped away and damaged areas to try and restain it in. But uh, just to bring back some shine to it and darken it up a little bit, brown shoe polish works fantastic. It's wax. It's brown. Same you know same color as as the wood. Does a really nice job at uh, ref, you know refreshing the uh, covers because these were not. Uh, protected in any way. These were just stained, and that was it. They had no actual finish on them. So actually applying a little bit of shoe polish, I know a lot of people, oh, Mike, why in the hell are you using shoe polish? It's wax. Don't don't get that shoe part stuck in your head. It's just wax with a little bit of brown dye in it. But like I say, it works great for protecting wood like this. You know, if you apply a coat or two of uh, 
brown shoe polish to this, it's going to be a lot more well protected than it was when it left the factory. And it's going to look better because it will actually have a, a nice shine to it. But the, you can see, looks all good now. Um, got the microphone cleaned up. Again, yeah, I think I'd shown that. That was pretty nasty. That clean, see, that's nice and shiny now. So, a little bit of a, again, a little bit more elbow grease with the metal polish. That cleaned up nicely. Um, get her turned off here because it's going to go off as soon as I pop the top cover anyhow. So, got the support braces put back in. And yes, even though they write it on here, do not use the handle. I have seen these things bent before where people try to pick the radio up with these little braces. And I'm here to guarantee to tell you, I guarantee you, if you try to pick the radio up with these little little thin, flimsy aluminum braces, you're going to bend them. They're just there to support the rear structure so it can't get pushed in <laughs> and keep it and keep it from bowing, which puts stress on the piano hinge. Um, so you'd seen the inside, uh, like I say, that's about the only thing I've put the put the end caps, the bottom top covers on, put the uh, reflector back in for the uh, for the meter and control, um, and that's. Let's see, replaced clarifier. I did end up replacing one crystal in this. Um, there's, it actually has a lot of crystals that are out of spec on this. But like I said, it has that switch. Uh, left that in. Just tied the wires up neatly. Um, but with that, you can lock in the transmit frequency to the VFO. So it really doesn't matter if any of those other crystals are bad. Just flip over to manual. Make sure you have that in VFO in the VFO's position. The transmit is then locked in, and you can just use the VFO instead. And besides that, you know, if you're using the crystal control in this radio, it only gives you 23 channels because it's a 23 channel radio. So, yep, there's all the parts that were replaced. There's actually just the empty tube boxes. Tubes are down in there. There's that uh, section of the control that kind of self-destructed. And somebody may have, because I've seen that actually, some radios where all of the controls look like this, not just trams, anything. Um, people use penetrating oil. They'll spray something like WD-40 or lubricating products in their controls. If you want this to happen to your controls, I guarantee you that's the best way to make this happen. Spray penetrating oil in your control. <laughs> it just, it just delaminates this resist, resistive material off the controls. So yeah, use proper tuner cleaner type products on this. Um, you know, cam caps and the mounting tabs, uh, there was that, uh, fuse that, uh, on the, uh, low power, or uh, low voltage supply board, it was bad. I went ahead and replaced this one, that's the fuse down over here in the fuse holder, just because it was so, you could see how corroded it was, so I just stuck a new one in there. I'm not going to try and clean, I'd spend more time trying to clean the corrosion off of that thing. Um, and then just, you know, the normal resistors, caps, there's a crystal floating around in this. There it is. There it is. See, I knew there was one in here somewhere. There's the crystal that was replaced. Um, and that's pretty much it. So, had a little bit of troubleshooting to do on this. Um, some of the problems, just as I went through the alignment, some of the problems went away. That's just because everything was so far out of alignment. And don't be surprised if that happens. You'll get a radio like this. You may even have crystals that don't uh, oscillate. Don't be surprised if you have a dead crystal. Sometimes, if you turn the radio on, leave it on for a while, once it starts working, it'll work fine then, from then on. I've seen that happen. Um, especially once you get into doing the alignment, once you get you know, the tunable transformers, especially their tuned circuits, sometimes they're just so far out of tune, the really strong crystals can oscillate fine, but if it's a, a weak crystal, it can't. And just the fact of doing the alignment a lot of times will, the crystals will start to work again. Um, it doesn't mean, doesn't mean they need to be replaced that they're weak. They just sit there and hum along for another 30 years just fine. It's just, and like I say, every crystal you could see originally back you know, earlier in the video where I was flipping through channels, had the spectrum analyzer on, and you could see, or it might have been on the assault. Yeah, you know, I think I had the scope probe hooked up to the output here, to the B output. But you could see the level would change. It varied. For every single channel, it was at a different level output. That's common because it's mixing two different crystals together. And actually, I think I had, now that I think about that, I think I had said the crystals were 20 megahertz. They're 16, they're in the 16 megahertz. It's the output is 20, in the 20 megahertz range, the crystals are 4 and 16 megahertz. 
just dawned on me. I think that's what I said. <laughs> I'd have to go back and look at the, the previous section of video. But uh, there you go, all cleaned up. Another one um, ready to uh, put back into service. Like I say, top cover cleaned up pretty nice. Does have a little ding there. Looks like somebody fixed up at one time and back over here. You know, a little paint, paint repair somebody had done. But uh, otherwise, yeah, I was actually surprised the top cover cleaned up really nice. Like I say, it was it, it was kind of like the inside. You couldn't barely see it for all the dirt. So there you go. Another Tram D201 brought back to life. Um, give her a second here. We'll watch the needle swing. And yes, some people have asked me. My needle goes over, the whole way over to the right. You can see it drop down there. And it's not going to do it. Okay, sometimes they'll, they'll sweep. Uh, yeah. I had it hooked up to an antenna too. That doesn't help much. That's putting voltage into it. But sometimes you'll see uh, the needles will sweep the whole way to the right and then they'll return. Um, and a lot of radios will do that. As the tubes warm up, the needle will sweep right, come down, and then it'll start working right. And you saw there, it can sweep back the other way. But, uh, oh, and one thing, when you're working on radios like this, a lot of people, I actually know somebody that got shocked inside one of these radios. Be careful. There's high voltage in places you probably don't realize are high voltage. And parts that I'm talking about are the meter. The meter in this thing runs at 100 volts plus. Okay? This is this is not a little, you know, couple couple volt or you know like a half volt. And I think people are mistaken in thinking that meters are very low voltage. No, meters can have a lot of voltage on them. It's just very, very little current. And in this radio, because this is an earlier radio, now the later D201As had, the meter was actually solid state controlled. But in these radios, it's actually two vacuum tubes. They're using a section out of one tube over here and a section out of one tube over here, and it's a balance. So they just put a hunt, you know, if, if you have exactly 100 volts on this terminal and 100 volts on this terminal, the needle will be at zero. You zero the needle with the zero adjustment inside, but there's no potential difference there. And that's what happens. As one becomes more positive or negative, the needle swings. But like I say, that's at 100 plus volts. It's that meter, and that's where that guy got shocked. He said, man, I stuck my hand, hand down in there. I think he was doing light bulbs or something. He had taken the shield out and had his hand down in there, and the radio was turned on, and he had the safety interlock disabled. Now, when I do it, like I say, this is hooked up to an isolation transformer, and I know what I'm, I know what to be careful of inside of these. Uh, he didn't think there was high voltage on that, so, you know, just be very, very careful. I can't overstate that enough. There is high voltage. That's why they put that safety interlock in there. There's high voltage everywhere in this thing. The last thing we want to do is see somebody die because they were trying to change a light bulb. So, there you go. Another Tram D201 put back into service.